there. I'm board certified professional organizer, Kathy Burns. I'm really glad you're here. This podcast is designed for busy entrepreneurs just like you who want to take better control of your business and move forward with less stress and more success. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. The Organized Energized Podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at thepodcast.organizedandenergized.com. Come back often and feel free to add this podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can also follow me on Twitter at Organized Energy and Facebook. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. Hi, everyone. This is Kathy, and we are back with the Organize and Energize podcast. Today, we're going to talk about how to become the CEO of your career. I want you to meet Tammy Alvarez. She's a visionary and the founder of the Career Winners Circle. She catalyzes leaders to level up their performance for themselves and their businesses with a comprehensive collection of coaching and training programs that are designed to strengthen the leaders to grow their careers quickly and sustainably. Her spirited break all the rules approach, which I love, blends 20 plus years of C-suite experience on Wall Street with a pragmatic results-based coaching style. She helps business professionals create an impact so they can love every Monday morning again. So let's jump in and let's meet Tammy. Hi, everyone. We're back. I'm with Tammy Alvarez. She is the CEO of the Clear Winner Circle. And today we're going to talk about winning and keeping your sanity at the same time. And Tammy is a good case in point of how you can create whatever kind of reality you want. Uh, so let's jump into it. And thanks, Tammy, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. This is great. Yeah, I'm excited. Okay, so let's talk about your journey. I know you've landed now in Mexico City, which I'm totally intrigued about, and after spending time in Belize, which is one of my favorite countries in the world. So talk to me about the journey of how did you move from Wall Street to where you're, what you're doing right now? Yeah, it's a fun journey, and it's one that either people think is terrifying or they want to do, depending on what side of that coin you're on. Um, I spent my career on Wall Street, and I became a C-suite executive managing 2,000 people in 54 countries. It was just crazy. And I loved it. And, you know, it thrived. I, my, my career thrived and I was fortified and just stepped into every day with joy until I didn't. And I just remember that moment where I was like, it started to go from invigorating to soul crushing. And once I kind of hit that line, it just free fell. And I just really started to have that apathetic view. And that was never like me. And um, so, you know, at the height of my career where everybody thought, okay, you've made it, the big office, the big fancy apartment, all those things, I decided that this no longer served me. And so about six years ago, I cashed out of Wall Street. I moved to a tropical island in Central America uh, in Belize and lived on that tropical island for five years and started this coaching business. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, right? You can lead a big corporate, but entrepreneurship was a whole new world for me. Um, so I'm excited to share all the mistakes and all the foibles that I've made. Um, but then after five years in Belize, we really loved everything, but we were ready for urban again. I'm a New York city girl. And mm -hmm. so we did some country shopping and now we are here in Mexico city for as long as we want to be. I think it's fantastic that uh, you went to the extreme, you know, you left all the hubbub. You're like, I've got to add space and debrief and defunct my life. And let's go to an island and let's just kind of cast things away. But then you're like, I got to do something. I'm going to launch a business. So how did you find that? Uh, did you find that challenging with internet and whatnot? Did you do it over Zoom or how did that all, what, what happened? Yeah. Um, so I did this before anyone knew what Zoom was. And so in New York metro area and a coaching business, I was like, you can't do this remotely. What's Zoom? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I can. And uh, Google it. You'll figure it out. And so I had a, it was an interesting, it was an interesting experience because on one hand, I had the freedom from all of the, the American culture of more. Yeah. And I had the freedom from keeping up with the Joneses and my expensive apartment and the fancy shoes and the handbags and the lifestyle. So my expenses plummeted, which was a great time to start a business. Um, yet I was disconnected now. 
I wasn't there at the pulse of what was happening every day. And as it turns out, like and starting a business, you know, for everyone who's done that, which is your audience, you know how hard it is. And I think some of the bigger challenges were for me were going from a high pressure corporate role to being alone where no one even knew or cared that I existed. <laughs> It was so weird. I'm like, where's all my meetings? Where's the light outside my door? Where's, you know, and so I felt very lonely and, you know, and I'm also uh, the magpie is my spirit animal. I love shiny objects. I will chase all of them. And so I spent a lot of the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey, um, just going down rabbit holes that didn't serve me until I finally figured it out with, with some help. So being on that tropical Island really gave me a break that I didn't know I needed. Um, it gave me a place to center and find balance because I never had balance. Even when I was raising a family, it was always work first. So finding the, I almost giving myself the permission to go scuba diving in the morning before work felt really weird. And uh, you know, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm like, I know what I'm accountable to, but I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this. It's not how it's done. And I found a way to grow a thriving practice while working about 30 hours a week. And so, so for me, it was a really fun journey because socially is very different and the pace is different, but I need to be challenged. And that's why I left my corporate career is because I was no longer challenged. So I'm stepping into this environment where I had no idea what I was doing. And I purposely went to a business to consumer model because I promised myself for the first three years, you're only selling B2C because I knew if I went back and sold B2B coaching services or consulting, I'd be right back in the environment that I left because I was still addicted to it and I right. needed to detox. And so that was, um, it was quite a journey trying to learn all that. I'm sure. I'm sure. And, but intuitively you knew that you had to debrief and defunct, you know, um, I, I applaud you on that when I had 10 months off to reinvent myself and I, it took me three months to even settle into, I'm not in guilt anymore. I don't have to do this thing. I'm not guilty for doing this. You know, it's like, Oh, okay. There is no real accountability. Okay. This is interesting, but I should be figuring it out. Right. <laughs> well, I have to be busy. Yeah. My husband, I had a year off, right? My husband finally said, if you, at, at, I think months, two and a half, if you don't settle down, you take the job working for the man and I'll take the year off because yeah. you're going to be reinventing yourself right now. And I'm like, oh, okay. That was my wake up call. Um, totally. What I, what I wanted to think, what I, my first question for you is how did you land that first client? How did you find clients on a little old Island in Belize to do what you wanted to do with your new career? Um, all of my clients are in the US and the UK, right? So right. there was no clients for me in Belize. It's a tropical right. island with hospitality, yeah. scuba diving, and amazing palapa bars everywhere. It's a vacation place. Right. And so, um, you know, it's got a big expat community, but they're all retired, yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. Or, you know, so so there were no clients for me in Belize. So I worked my network and, you know, I, I continued to listen to all the experts, right? I didn't know what a sales funnel was. I had no idea what an email campaign was or what email automation, like none of these things uh, were things that I was aware of. And right. so I'm listening to all the big names and I'm trying to do all the things that they say to do. And it is a disaster because all of those things only work if you have a million dollar advertising budget. They forget to tell you that part. And so eventually I found some really good advisors that were just a few steps ahead of me, you know, in terms of how things really got done. Yeah. And I spent, you know, I think one of the, the key moments where I started to focus on, there were two key moments that I really started to focus on client acquisition. The first one was I had a very good advisor who was also on the island, but retired, had sold several companies, sat on boards. And so, you know, we would have a margarita and, you know, talk about the business. And he was a very good advisor and I was chasing all the things. And he sat me down. He's like, Tammy, without revenue, you don't have a company. Right. This is the only thing you should be focused on. Cause I want to write a book. I want to do all these things. And he's like, you need money. And I'm like, that's yeah. probably a good point. Now, Wall Street girl, like you think I would know this. And I, and you know, I, I spent so much time completely disassociating everything I ever knew because I wanted a fresh start, but I forgot to bring some of the common sense things in with me. So that was a, that was a nice wake up call. Like you've got no other focus in your whole life for the next three years, other than to generate income and make this a viable company. 
Um, and so then I started to look at how do I do that? Where do I find my tribe? And the reality is my tribe found me. Yeah. Um, I was the transformation. Go ahead. Let me just uh, join something that you said that was very interesting to me is that you found advisors that were just a few steps above you. Like you don't go for the multi-million dollar gurus to advise you. I mean, I totally think that this is true. You have people who are just a little bit ahead of you because they can relate to where yes. you are and they can give you more exactly. practical, applicable, actionable tips. So, yes. yeah. And the pain is still fresh. <laughs> right. right. Like, and, and they're going to get real. Yeah, they're gonna get real with you. They're gonna say, "No, no, doesn't no, work that no. way." Yes. yes. Okay. Exactly. So one. I Absolutely. Just that was yeah. Thank you for stopping me on that because you know it was a, a very you know it's an important key point. And then I think the other piece of advice that I got that really helped is because um, my business found me. I was a transformation expert on Wall Street. So when there was crisis and everyone was running out of the building, me and my teams were running in, and I loved it. I loved change, transformation. Fortunately, in financial services, it's always a mess, right? So there's always something to do. And I thought that's what I'd coach on because most people suck at change and transformation. So I'm like, great business opportunity. But the other issue with that, and this is kind of where I started to learn how to lean into being smart and thinking about things differently is that, yes, I'm a transformation expert and have a lot of value to offer. But I also said, I'm only doing business to consumer. And what I didn't think to check on is are individuals willing to self-fund their leadership development to become better transformation leaders? The answer to that was no, <laughs> they're not. And so, um, you know, companies will pay for it, but as an individual, they will not. And so my business started to find me as I was talking to people and they're like, I don't need that, but I am in a career I hate. And I am stuck in the ivory tower in the soul crushing grind. And I want to know how I can live on a tropical island like you. Mm -hmm. And while they didn't necessarily mean that literally, it was very much um, part of an accidental twist in my business in helping mid to senior level leaders get out of the soul crushing grind and pivot into something that they love without having to give everything up that they've worked so hard for. And so that found me. And then, so I think listening to what the needs are versus what you think you're going to do. I think every entrepreneur I've ever coached is not doing what they thought they'd be doing. Right. And, and it's important what, to know that. What I think is important about what you said is that it's back to the avatar. I mean, I took so much training and who's your avatar, right? Your avatar is you. Yes. <laughs> the people who want to hire you are you. Yeah, they, you know, they they were you. They want to not be like you were. You, they want to trans transform like you wanted to. I mean, that that's where it's at. And I think that we spend so much time. I mean, I I wasted so many thousands of dollars trying to figure out avatar that now it just comes down to the simple thing that my avatar is me. Yeah. Your avatar is you. Yeah, the people who need you are who you are, and they're yeah. like you. <laughs> well, it was funny because I just had this conversation with um, our coaching teams. So we've got about seven coaches on the team now. And, you know, we're talking their target market and all that stuff. I'm like, you're coaching you. Yeah. So just go find people like you because A, you like them. They'll like you back and you're going to be able to close business much faster. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, you're not going to make a million dollars selling that online. So you can't say that out loud. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's just don't blow your money on that kind of stuff. And I love the fact that you said, you know, we we're chasing shiny objects. That's what we do as entrepreneurs. When we launch, we're like that guru, that guru, this is the, this is the, this, the answer, this, the answer, you know, let's, let's put all those answers together. And I, I agree with you when they don't say, well, you need to have like a big budget to do what we're going to say that you're going to do. Well, um, and so. the other thing I got sucked into and um, a good friend finally just smacked me upside the head and said, what are you doing is, you know, you look at the vanity metrics on social media. So this one has like 17,000 likes and this one has like 30 comments and, you know, and you're like, okay, I need more. I need a bigger mailing list. I need more. I need more. And, you know, one of the, the um, friends and advisors that, that kind of helped me get this stuff set up, she's like, why don't you spend time loving on the people you have mm -hmm. instead of always worrying about getting more and being bigger? And again, these things are so simple, but they were not obvious to me. 
And because you get sucked into as a new entrepreneur, okay, what's everybody doing? Let me repeat a process that already works. And, um, and so when I started to lean into the community that wanted to be with me, instead of worrying about trying to attract all the ones that were just too busy to care or not the right time. So I started to do that. Then things started to really change for me. Yeah. This is a writer down moment. You guys, this is a writer down moment, right? Yeah. Love the ones who love you. Love the ones who are following you or they just smother them in love. And it doesn't matter if there's only 20, just love yeah. them. It you know, um, because then that 20 is going to turn to 30, it's going to turn into a hundred, you know, and, and those types of things. And so that was, um, that was really, uh, an important lesson for me to learn is to stop caring about what everyone else was doing and just mm -hmm. lean into who I'm here to serve mm -hmm. and make sure that those experiences are epic. Yeah. Let's talk about one of your favorite client experiences. Tell me a story about someone. There's so um, many. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, it's like, and it's funny. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, shameless plug. I just wrote a book and it's coming out mid-January. So there's tons Ooh. of my client stories in there. Um, but I think my favorite stories, you know, I've got, I've got this one client that's been with me, you know, for, for a bit, high ambition, high talent, and, you know, incredibly focused and just an amazing leader. And she joined an organization in its earlier days. You know, it just kind of went from zero to explosion. And then they're going to go public. And she's part of that team. And then it falls apart. They don't go public. Everything just goes to hell in a handbasket. And she's leading through all of this adversity. And meanwhile, you know, she's just getting pot shots. And it's just all of these things. And so... What's interesting to me in terms of the work that I do with both my leadership and my and and my entrepreneurial clients is that people who have ambition are used to putting themselves out of their comfort zone. Yeah. But yet, you know, sometimes, but no one wins alone. And success is not linear. Right. And so when you feel like you're ambitious and you know you're going for it, and then you kind of get halfway there, but then somebody cuts you off at the knees and you gotta go back and try again. And we do that with our businesses too. And so helping them maintain perspective, right? Helping them with strategies that have worked for me in the past, because we do advisory and coaching. So it's kind of a blend of coach salting instead of just asking a million questions and hoping they find the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, and just helping them find that inner resilience. Because that is the stuff that lasts, mm -hmm. right? Tactics, situations, they change. We are always going to have challenges. And so it's trying to figure out how do you get through that brick wall without giving yourself a massive concussion and then using those skills over and over again. So did she want to transition out or why did she? You know, she didn't at first. And so she was just trying to survive the crazy because she really bought into the mission of the organization. You know, she loved the company, she loved the culture, she loved the clients. And so this company that she loved was also, you know, just sucking the life out of her. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't figure out, she had a deep, deep sense of loyalty. And we can talk about misplaced loyalty in terms of corporate environments all day long. But, you know, that's not what this conversation's about. And so she was conflicted. Like, I need to provide for my team. I need to leave a legacy. I need to make sure that they're going to be okay, you know, when I'm not here. And so we were on a two year journey to help her, you know, through chaos, you know, up, down and sideways, mm -hmm. be able to get to a point where she could finally say, you guys are good. And like three of her people moved into C-suite roles. Like, you know, so she was really able to be very, very purposeful in her values. And in the things that were important to her, despite the personal sacrifices she was making, mm -hmm. to be able to write her own chapter and to be able to say, you know, yes, I want to do something different. And now she's on to, you know, doing um, a really amazing things in, in a very different industry. But she wanted to make sure that the organization she loved so much mm -hmm. was left in incredibly good shape. Mm -hmm. And so it was just I think that's, you know, the, the journey, the wins, the losses, the, you know, the tears, the laughter, all those things, as you're going through that with your clients and you're really helping them find their way. And then you see them come out on the other end. 
right? And now, mm-hmm. so she's never taken a break. So she decided to, um, once she left, which was um, the, earlier this year, she took the summer off and went to Greece and Italy. And she had an amazing time, you know, now she's back in New York and, you know, she's, um, she's working with um, private equity companies, you know, in terms of helping, you know, manage their organizations as a um, operating partner, which is a totally different career, but using all the things that are her superpower. Right. Right. Yeah. I always think, you know, what you should be doing is stuff that that's, comes natural to you, you know, whatever natural to you that I always say that you can do a sleep uh, standing on your head. That's your Dharma. That's your gift. That's what you give back to the world because that's actually what you were born to do, you know, yeah. to give. Well, and, and so especially that becomes the easy, I think for anybody out there who's listening, who's looking to reinvent, you know, think about what do you naturally do? Yeah. What's so easy for you? You know, like me, it's change. For you, it's change, right? You're going to run into the fire. I'm probably going to run into the fire just because I I want to have the thrills, right? Yeah, (laughs) a gentle and junkie, totally. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And and we love change and thrive. And some people hate it, but you know, what can you do naturally? uh, For those who are listening, standing on your head asleep, so to speak, this just like so easy and so effortless and just flows right off of you. That's what you do as you're in yourself. And I also recommend they take it one step further and focus on what energizes you. Yes. Right. Because there are things that come easy that, you know, are easy and natural. And I also think there are things that light you up. And so what are the things that you can do for 12 hours a day and end the day more energized than when you started? And, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, we do all of it. Yeah. Until we get teams, you know, like we do all of it. And, you know, there are things like this I could do all day, coaching my coaches, coaching my clients, love that stuff. That's energizing. Yeah. Social media, the money part, you know, all the other things that go along with it. Can I do them? Yes. Do they energize me? No. About two hours later, I'm just ready to throw pencils at the ceiling and spin around for a little while. Right. Um, And so I think kind of stuff you delegate. Totally. Absolutely. I was, well, that's where Wall Street helped because I was very fast to know the things I suck at and make sure I had people who loved those things. So that way we were in you know, good shape with that. So, and I think a lot of people missed that part initially because like, oh, I'm not making enough money yet. So I can't spend money. Um, and it's that dichotomy of income versus, you know, spending it in the right ways to help you free up the time. So you can do the things that you are excellent at and that will make your business grow faster. Yeah, I just heard an amazing statistic from the Harvard Business uh, Journal that if you do, if the if if a company doesn't spend, I think it's uh, eighty two thousand dollars in the first three years of growing their business, they will most likely fail. Interesting. So there is so there is yeah. an expenditure that you have to make. You just have to make sure that you're spending it in the right way. Yeah. And if you're thinking when you're like you said earlier, you think, oh, I can't delegate. I can't. I can't do this. I can't hire that. You can't not do that. Right. So if you're underfunded, you know, you, you've got to be able to have delegate what you hate. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get burnt out. Well, and there's tons of resources. You know, yeah. they don't all have to be high price, expensive local resources. And so, um, you know, like we got together, you know, through somebody on my team from the Philippines. Right. Mm-hmm. I've got teammates that are all over the world. Um, and so especially today, I think entrepreneurs have so much more available options in terms of time, cost, and quality. And, yeah. and it's important to make sure that we review those and, and know what we have available because we're the only engine that drives our business until it starts getting big enough. And that engine has got to be functioning at top speed. Right, right, yeah. And not sputtering for air or sputtering for gas or just sputtering in general from burnout. <laughs> well, I was going to say like burnout is such a huge thing, not just for corporate, but for entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of is that I've really been able to build a thriving company. And I don't think I've worked more than 30 hours a week since I started six years ago. Love it. And so, you know, it's not a superpower. It can be done. And it, I think it's one of the... One of the biggest things that I try to talk to my clients about is really having this experimental mindset because nothing ever goes the way you think. And so if you continually experiment, say, okay, let's try this. What does this button do? Mm -hmm. Keep the things that work, tweak the things that were meh and get rid of the things that didn't and continue to do that cycle. Then you're going to be able to grow your business much faster. 
Absolutely. That's really good advice as well. You're just a wealth of this information. Thank so, you. <laughs> what, okay. So obviously you're very well organized because you're only working 30 hours a week. You're in this amazing business. What's your favorite organizing hack or tactic? What do you use to keep yourself? Uh, what's your favorite hack? Yeah. So I am a tech freak and, uh, but yet I hate tech. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, you know, so I love the tools and toys and I'm just, I don't have the superpowers to connect them together. Um, so, but we automate everything. And I started doing that even when I was little and that way it kind of built as we go. So for example, you know, we use, um, not an advertisement at all, but you know, so we use just Google workspace as a team, yeah. but you know, click up is, you know, is connected. Everything is integrated. And so you don't have to think about anything. It's just all there. Yeah. You know, in terms of our CRM, you know, you pop on our website and you go in through a specific coach, one of our coaches, then we're going to know where you came from. And then you're going to automatically go into our email campaign under that coach. That's going to hit their, you know, their CRM. So they know they've got a new client that's integrated with our portal. And so all of my, you know, software solutions are SaaS, right? So, and they're low cost. And so spending just a little bit of money to get all of these things to talk to each other saves me, I would say, and my team, you know, I can't even imagine how many hours just in organization, communication, you know, we're always in alignment and all of those things. So for me, it's all about the tech integration and yeah. using it to its fullest advantage. Yeah, things have to talk to each other and they have to get along and play nicely. And, uh, you know, as a professional organizer, that's something that I always discern is like, do you have two things competing in the background, fighting against each other? Do you have things that are half baked? Half the yes. time we have all these new, you know, we, we go for the gadgets, bells and whistles, and then there's something half baked in the background that's screwing up your other one that's really working or you don't even know what's working, right? Yes. So um, I, I love Google, work, Google Workspace. I think it's a fantastic Fantastic. Yeah. When it was more than just me, I was, wasn't was sure whether I was going to go 360 or Google and, you know, cause we started building a team. So we needed to, you know, have a shared space and I just love the collaboration features. Yeah. Um, nothing's perfect. So, right. So, but Mercury's in retrograde, nothing works anyway. So you may as well figure that out. Right. So that's coming in <laughs> December. Just so you I learned never to launch when Mercury's in retrograde and I'm not an airy fairy person, but I've definitely gotten my clock cleaned more than once, yeah. uh, trying to do some kind of launch during that time. Um, for perfect what time for closure. Yeah. Exactly. time to wrap and close. <laughs> totally. And I okay. think on a personal level, in terms of staying organized, um, you know, I block my calendars for the things that are hardest and I do them when I'm at my best. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I age, mornings are better for brain time, you know, so the things that I hate or the things that I just that don't come naturally, but that need to get done, like that is the stuff that I will do first thing while my brain is fresh, while I still have patience and, you know, before the day gets going. So that's another way that I stay organized just in terms of my own personal productivity. Yeah, you're following Mark Twain's advice. If you have to eat a frog, do it first thing in the morning. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, yes. do it when you're fresh. I, I just got know. back from France. There's a lot of really frogs there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we won't be eating any frogs. No, um, no, don't do that. Okay, so uh, just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap. So if you had to look back and tell your 18-year-old self something, give her some little piece of advice, a nugget, a piece of gold, what would you tell her? I would tell my 18 year old self that you are more than good enough, just as you are. Mm, yeah. I, you know, growing up, we grew up poor, long story short, parents split up. We ended up homeless, my mom and my sister and I for a while. So I was always in this overachievement mode mm -hmm. and I didn't go to college until I was 40. So I didn't get my degree until I was 40. So I started what? my professional career very differently. And so that informed, like, I, I just showed up different. I played different. I had high risks. And I had the imposter syndrome every day because mm -hmm. I didn't belong. I wasn't like everyone else. I wasn't as smart. I wasn't well-traveled. I wasn't as all the things. And so I spent my entire life thinking I'm not enough. I, you know, and which made me try even harder to prove myself, you know, mm -hmm. and it worked in terms of outward success, but the inner turmoil of always feeling like I was less than. And, you know, it wasn't until later in my career where I had this epic moment um, where my boss finally told me you're here because you're not like everyone else. 
You're here because you're different. So I always looked at it as a concession, like, okay, I'm here, even though I'm different. And mm-hmm. it never, it, it didn't occur to me until much later in my career that that was actually my competitive advantage. Yeah. Because, and yeah. our own unique, I think our own unique self is our competitive advantage always on yes. anything, Absolutely. especially as entrepreneurs, you know, well, like, that's, that's what you trade on. Yeah. Right. You're trading on your uniqueness. You're trading on your perspectives and, and, you know, either being the contrarian or, you know, having an innovation, whatever the case may be, it's like, it's that point of differentiation that defines our organization that we're trying to build and how we show up to serve the world. Exactly. And only you can be you, which is a great thing because no one can be you. And so that's why I, you know, I, I love, I don't even consider competition competition. I just love the diversity. Uh, That's why I have so many other pro organizers on this show. I mean, we all are so different and we all do things a different way. And it's just, it's thrilling to me to see everybody bring their unique gifts to the world in the way that they bring it to the world. And, you know, we will resonate back to the avatar. We will resonate with people who are like us anyhow. So who cares? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I always think, you know, when, when I start to coach people, because sometimes in corporate, they're like, oh, should I start my own business? Shouldn't I, you know, those types of things. And when everyone, every time someone feels like the market's too crowded, it's like, that's the perfect time to enter because you know, the market's established. You know, if no one's doing it, then there's a high probability no one either needs it or wants it. Um, You know, so you're better off jumping into the melee, differentiating yourself. And let's face it, how many customers do we really need to be prosperous and successful and, you know, feel like we're making an impact? It's not millions. No. So so just keep things in perspective and, you know, and and serve your market. Yeah. Especially when you're loving on them. When you're loving on them, they're going to grow and thrive and and it's all good, right? Yeah. Yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I know that you have something that you can give a valuable free resource to the people who are looking to maybe make a transition or just step up their business a little bit. Uh, What is it, Tammy, that you will offer? Okay. So we are offering today um, a copy of our resiliency roadmap. And so it's, you know, it's a step-by-step guide on how to really step into having the resilience you need as a business owner. And that's getting rid of all the inner junk in our head, you know, that's being able to flex and adapt and things like that. So we'll make sure that we have that link for you in our show notes. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Put it down below and uh, click on it. Is there anything that you could say verbally for people who are listening who might not have show notes? Do you have a URL? That's sure. There? Yeah, you can hit um, the, you know, uh, the career, career com, okay. And in there, uh, you'll see the option to download that resiliency roadmap. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, is there anything that I forgot to ask you that we should have touched on? Anything in your brain that you're like, I I love where the conversation has gone. I think we've really covered a lot of ground in in a short period of time. Um, You know, I think the 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 parting words I want to leave with with the audience is to really step into what lights you up. And we talked about that a little bit Mm -hmm. because I think we get so bogged down into like the stress of life, the stress of what's going on in the world, the rate of change, you know, all of these things are just kind of hitting us from all different angles. And sometimes it feels like you can't even come up for air. Mm -hmm. And so if you can put yourself in your little happy bubble, you know, and kind of focus on the things that light you up and the things that you can control as you're growing your business without letting all of those external factors continue to drag you down, provide distractions and all of those things. I think both from a mental wellness perspective, as well as from a business perspective, that you're going to be much better off because there's just so much going on right now that can just, you know, just destroy our will, you know, to persevere. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Look for that spark of happiness and uh, follow what lights you up and the should do's, the the have to do's, the want to do's, just get rid of all the do's, get rid of all the do-do. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) And follow, follow what lights you up. I think that's really, really good advice. Well, this has been huge pleasure. Uh, I absolutely love speaking with people with different modalities. Um, I am so excited that you're living in Mexico City and you're living the dream of what you want to do and that you were able to reinvent yourself and do whatever the heck you want. Everybody tap into Tammy's resource because you know what? 
we can all do whatever we want to do. We just have to know that to be true. Yeah. So download the resource and that will help you move forward. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much today. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And we'll hopefully see you soon in Mexico City. It's on my come list. Visit. Definitely come <laughs> visit. <laughs> you got it. Thanks again. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to this podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you want to hear more, feel free to subscribe on the platform of your choice. Also, if you feel so inclined, I would truly appreciate a good rating from you to me. Have a stellar day.